so he was right, but only in his limited experimental circumstances, and not really right for most people living freely. Now, at this point, I just want you to recall, I mentioned earlier that cancer cells usually overexpress glucose-1 transporters, which are saturated in the physiologic range. That's cleverness of cancer cells, right? They can pirate glucose from the blood even when you're on a low-carb diet. And hexokinases, which phosphorylate the glucose. So they actually ensure a high constant supply of glucose transport and phosphorylation even on a low-carb diet. No, this doesn't, this doesn't sound good. So glucose 1 overexpression, though, on the other hand, they make the cancer cells behave suspiciously like a glycemic and insulinemic clamp because they have a high constant source of glucose uptake into them. So they may, in fact, be susceptible to something like a Randall cycle. All right, so it's therefore possible that fatty acids in ketone bodies generated during carb restriction might inhibit glycolysis selectively in cancers and leaving adapted normal cells alone. This was where you know, some of the thinking was going. And, but there are two requirements for this to occur, and they're both big ifs. One, the fatty acids in the ketone bodies have to be metabolized in order to make acetyl-CoA and citrate. Cancer cells are pretty clever at <coughs> defeating metabolic regulation. All they have to do is de-express some of the enzymes that do that, and it won't work. Second thing, ATP, ATP production in normal cells is maintained by acetyl-CoA, right? So, ATP production during respiration would somehow have to be uncoupled from the Krebs cycle in order for this to work. Because then, this alternate source of acetyl-CoA in Krebs cycle substrate would not be producing ATP in compensatory fashion. So the question is, is this good news or bad news? As I say, cancers are very clever about evading regulation and they could downregulate the transport or the metabolism of the ketone bodies and fatty acids, and why in the world would they uncouple? I mean, it wouldn't be in their interest to give up their ATP, would it? Well, this goes back again to the articles from the 1980s when they were looking at this sort of thing. And this was from uh, Furon and Tisdale's group. Remember I showed you that other article where they showed that ketosis inhibited a cancer. Well, here they had another article, the failure of ketosis to control cachexia and the growth rate, rate of the Walker 256 carcinoma in rats. And they pointed out that the Walker 256 carcinoma, and they did very detailed biochemical uh, studies, lacks three keto acid CoA transfers. Well, what that just means is that you can't get from fatty acids or ketone bodies to acetyl-CoA. You can't metabolism, it's not gonna work. Now, so this actually is consistent with the idea that if you can't metabolism, it won't work, but if you can metabolize them, it might. This was a puzzle to them, all right? At that time, they didn't know some of the things we know now. And the role of energy uncoupling now becomes important because it's been largely unexplored until recently. Why would cancer cells uncouple? Well, first of all, we have to know that respiration in mitochondria is associated with the production, as I mentioned before, of reactive oxygen species. And this is to which some cancer cells may be susceptible, especially since they're hypoxic, in which case they would undergo apoptosis. So cancer cells have to develop protective mechanisms right, against apoptosis. That's what I was telling you before. Turns out, uncoupling can reduce reactive oxygen species. So it could very well be that the production of uncoupling protein 2, which I'll come to in a second, could be a cancer cell survival adaptation strategy. That's the reason they uncouple. And in fact, there are articles to support exactly that. The cancers, that uncoupling would be a survival strategy. Haramoto showed that this increased uncoupling protein in most human colon cancers, they had 120 biopsy specimens, and 87% of the ones that were aggressive showed the highest increase in uncoupling protein too. Yes? Excuse me, this uncoupling, is that like a metastasizing? No, no, uncoupling is just within the Krebs cycle that, uh, as I say, NADH is produced by the Krebs cycle. But the ATP is actually not made by the Krebs cycle directly. It's made actually by the, uh, the diffusion of hydrogen protons down the, uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, the, F, the F1 particle which is actually the ATP synthetase part. So it's that diffusion energy that actually gets converted into chemical energy, but as that happens, ADP gets transported into ATP. So it's that diffusion of hydrogen. So if you uh, introduce it, it pores, help, uh, yeah. The, the uh, analogy that I give my students is uh, that it's like putting a car uh, in neutral. 
so the engine can run, but it's no longer connected to the wheels. So if you think, yeah, so if you think of the wheels as ATP production, that is, utilizing energy, you can still run the engine, that is, you can still use the food, but it's not doing anything good for you. So uh, the UCP, uh, the uncoupling proteins, is like, it's just like putting, uh, separating a clutch. And uh, another paper by Sabine showed essentially the same thing. Decreased ATP synthesis by 50% in non-controlled thyroid cancer with twice the uncoupling protein 2. Farper all showed something similar. So uncoupling protein 2, in a number of studies, and there are several others, seems to be behaving as an uncoupling agent, particularly in aggressive cancers. So, an epoxic cancer phenotype, all right? Increased GLUT1 transporters, right? That's how they get higher glucose from the blood but increase the coupling protein 2 to spare them from apoptosis, all right, by reducing reactive oxygen species, might respond to decreased carbohydrate by increased glycolytic, as in the Randall cycle, therefore getting decreased ATP production from reduced glycolysis, but also there might be reduced ATP due, due to uncoupling. So they're not getting compensatory ATP from the fatty acids and ketones coming in. So that total reduced ATP may then cause decrease cell growth, cell growth being an energy dependent process. So this was our hypothesis, and basically we felt that low-carb diets deserve a look. And uh, there are a lot of things that could be done, I mentioned a lot of potential mechanisms. The simplest one to study is the one we chose in vitro, and I'll talk about them briefly. We have a cell culture study, which uh, we studied downstate, and a human trial, which I'll tell you about in a minute. The experimental design is actually very simple. This is time zero, and these are cells plated out in a petri dish. And say these are control cells, happen to be three fibroblast lines. Okay? Now these are seven different cancer lines. I mean, each, these are, this is a cancer line, and this is a control line. And this is 96 hours in glucose medium. We expect them to grow to a certain amount. In 96 hours, we expect the cancer lines to grow to a certain amount. We'll pull that amount 100%. Okay? Now, the hypothesis is that the controls, normal cells, are adapted to ketosis. So if you add a nutrient, acetoacetate, the ketone body, it shouldn't inhibit a normal cell. We'd expect no inhibition of growth if we add, if, if, if instead of looking at glucose medium alone, we did a separate experiment and we grew these cells to 96 hours in glucose plus acetoacetate, we would expect no change in normal cells. The hypothesis is, would cancer cells, however, show inhibition? Okay? Very simple idea. Idea roughly? Okay? Okay, so we had seven different aggressive cancer lines, three different fibroblast control lines. And this is what we found, 100% being, you know, compared to 96 hours in glucose alone, that the three different fibroblast lines, blue is cell growth, red is ATP. They all lay, lay within statistical error of 100% of, of, of growth. They were unaffected, in other words, by either growth or ATP in the control lines. Whereas all of the cancer lines showed some degree of both cell growth reduction, except the MCF7, which uh, was statistically within the normal range, but also had the most modest reduction in ATP. And they showed parallel reduction in ATP. So the actual reduction in ATP and growth was in parallel, which you can see on the next slide. This is actually the amount of cell growth reduction compared to ATP reduction. It lies along a linear regression line, absolutely linear, extending into the control group, which showed neither reduction in ATP nor growth, and had an R value of 0.95, which you don't usually get in biological samples, and very statistically significant. Now, all right, this didn't come out so well. All right, well, anyway, the point of it, however, is that the uncoupling protein 2 expression in the cancer lines was, in every instance, statistically higher and different than it was in the control lines, which, yeah, this, these are the control line uncoupling proteins, this is in the cancer lines. So the cancer is all overexpressed on coupling protein too. And uh, furthermore, the, the extent of increase in uncoupling protein two also correlated with the extent of, um, of inhibition of, the, uh, of, of growth in the cancer cells, okay? The R value wasn't as good principally because of one of the cancer lines was an outlier, but it still was significant correlation. 